What do you feel when I bring up cities? And I don't mean to inspire thoughts of a specific city. What I mean is the concept, the structure. For film, the term city often has one of two meanings. The first is a simple backdrop for the events of the world to take place in. The city itself means little. This can mean a number of films such as Avengers or Ghostbusters. Sure, it's there, but it's nothing more than a set piece. The second option tends to be the city becoming a place to project the negative aspects of our world. Think of films like Midnight Cowboy or Wolf of Wall Street, where the city is in decay either physically or morally, and often both. There exists a third option, though. One that's rarely seen or simply not seen enough, according to myself. And it is found in the city symphony, with films such as Le Ballon Rouge, Berlin, Die Sinfonie der Großstadt, and Chevrolet's Kino Apparato. These films embrace the city, the height of modernism, embracing its energy and vibrancy through depictions of pistons, gears, and other machinery. It presented a day in the life of a city from the mundane starts of its factory workers' days to the bustling nightlife. These were films that adored and loved the city, embracing its every day. And that's what I wish to talk about today. Not the city symphony, but embracing the urban. I wish to talk about a creator called Sizen, who I believe has depicted it in a light few others have. Now I want to make this clear from the start. What Sizen has created are not city symphony films. These short films of her creation have traditional narrative structures and do not engage with the surface level content and editing style of city symphonies. What they share is something deeper, more abstract, a love for the city as a space. Sizen depicts the urban landscape in a light not often shown, in a comforting, lived-in space. Now, it might be unclear by what I mean by the term lived-in. What I try to suggest with this term is the abstract idea of an environment that gives the quality of people's day-to-day -day taking place, placing the idea of a city where people's lives occur in the forefront and not an afterthought. It seems to be the overwhelming consensus in cinema, when it bothers to acknowledge the space it's in, that the city is a drab and miserable place that no one should want to live in. To show you what I mean, let's have a look at the Wolf of Wall Street and the subway ride home. The subway, a symbol of cities as a part of its mass transit network, becomes a symbol of failure, of drabness, the city a corrupt playground for the rich, and for the less fortunate it becomes a trap, a worker drone's hell, a slave to their corporate overlords where even when they win, they lose. But for Sizen, it's different. We have a similar setting, a public bus as opposed to a train, but it's totally different in subtext. Blanca is comfortable. She's not a wage slave, and nor is the location a symbol of negativity. The scene is washed in soothing browns, the soft line work accentuating this oozing feeling of comfort. In a montage sequence later, where Blanca is talking with Jamie, her love interest, the bus is shaded with different hues, but all ultimately convey a feeling of love and comfort in an environment that is not usually depicted this way. It's important that it happens in a public bus, as opposed to her room or any other more traditionally private sphere, because it means that these settings, a place of mass urban transit, can be spaces of life, of comfort, and not merely places to show the negativity of the modern world. Even this shot of the wind blowing in her hair is a romanticized image that I'm sure you've seen tons of times before, but now it is placed in existence with an urban environment, with a bus stop, not exactly the most romantic of places. Sizen embraces modernity, though what is considered modern has changed. Of course it would after a hundred years. Mass transit functions as a symbol of the modern world, and her music choice is no exception, with its distinctly modern nature, as she utilizes lo-fi as the soundtrack in One Year Later. A genre that is distinctly modern not only in its current popularity, but in its associated imagery of urban modern life and development as an artificial genre using synthesis and electronic methods of producing music as opposed to traditional instruments. So even in the choice of music, Sizen's work serves to embrace a comfortable modern urban environment. And make no mistake, one of Lo-Fi's elements is comfort, with images often being associated such as rainy city skylines and the studying girl. It's a genre that takes comfort in the urban, which makes it little wonder as to why Sizen uses it in her work. 
In city symphonies, cities act as open sites of connection and juxtaposition that many worlds, literally people, ideas, and goods from around the globe come and go, collide, pass through, and sometimes settle in them. And this idea is present in Sisson's train station as it's overwhelmed by peoples of all kinds. Mothers with children, friends gathering, lovers going about their days, and all of this hustle and bustle of the train station is in this pink hue, casting this cacophony of a station in a city as an urban symphony of love. Compare that back to Wolf of Wall Street, and this life and joy is even more clear. I should state now, before any misconceptions occur, these are not points that I'm making about some objective reality of a city. This is entirely subjective. It is not a distant analysis. I make no attempts to perform any objective analysis. One thing that Sizen manages to avoid falling into from the city symphony is what Manuel Castells refers to as the Ledic nucleus, the city as playground. With the city symphony's focus on energy and vibrance and its rambunctious depictions of nightlife, it can be that the city becomes depicted as an urban playground, and this is more often than not the case for films that place a positive spin on the city, mostly travel-focused films about tourists coming to major cities and playing around in them with films like Roman Holiday and Crazy Rich Asians. Sisson focuses more on the everyday, on the mundane to the highlight the beauty of it. She positions her characters in an average situation, nothing out of the ordinary. We share in their day-to-day -day and the splendor of the city around them. From train rides to quiet conversations at a parkside, these are lived-in moments. These are the subtle day-to-day. -day. This, to me, is what the city truly is about. A space where people can live. I don't mean to just scrape by or simply wake up the next day. I mean intimacy. Emotion. Many city symphonies echo George Simmel's analysis of the modern metropolis, presenting kaleidoscopic passages that suggest the hectic pace and disorientation of modern urban life. That is to say, the idea of the isolated city, where even though we are close physically, we are distant from one another. That is that ultimately the analysis suggests that the urban landscape is detrimental to us like in Brazil. But that isn't what's present here. These notions of the hectic, chaotic city, of the noisy, disorienting, disjointed, and disconnected from one another city, isn't here. These are notions we still hold onto today from over a hundred years ago, and here they are rejected outright. The city is intimate, not disconnected. It is a steady and measured rhythm of the day-to-day, -day, not hectic. It's a city, not a playground. I think it's most clear at the start of the second part of Hybrid Heroes Episode 2. It works towards an idea of a lived-in city with the conversations of the two friends taking place with the urban backdrop as meaningful to them, as part of their daily lives, from a riverbank to the train. These quiet moments among friends, intimate and kind, woven with the world around them, woven because it's the place they grew up in. It's a place that's a part of them, and their comfort in it shows that. As Maya chooses to change her life, the physical manifestation of this change is the train, which further cements the urban environment not only as integral but positive in her life, integral to her personal transformation. These urban environments are something that can be joyous, part of life in a positive manner away from connotations of divides or cogs in a capitalist machine. Sizen creates a city that often doesn't get shown. Amidst the backdrops and the drab melancholy, there exists a version of the city that can be as homely as any romanticized rural life fantasy. That isn't to say that this is the true face of the urban, or that it's not a fantasy, because it is. Those backdrops and drab melancholies are as real and as true as this one. It's just that I found in Sizen something that I haven't seen in a long time, and I wanted to talk about it. A city where things are nice. Hey, so uh, this is actually some bonus content uh, that wasn't able to fit into the video uh, cleanly, uh, but I figured I'd want to bring it up anyway uh, because it's pretty interesting. I messaged Sizen about a eight 
11 days ago, something like that, and asked her some questions about her work and even uh, asked, of course, for permission to utilize her, her footage. And I got some pretty interesting responses back that I wanted to bring up, for example, uh, on why she depicts her characters often on trains and other modes of mass transit is because traveling is a huge chunk of her story and that she uses these settings to have conversations and build relationships, which I think is brilliant if anything of what I said in the last 10 minutes has made any sense whatsoever. On top of that, depiction of cityscapes is also pretty interesting considering that she uses them and sees them this way due to her own past experiences, positives, you know, going and meeting with friends there during vacation and all the other interesting things that go on there. And I think that's pretty cool that then this translates and it kind of works well for me too, since honestly, the reason I like City so much is because I grew up in one and that's where I have all my good memories with. And, you know, that sort of applies to her reasons for the particular fondness where it's just like, hey, they're cool places and it's something that she has nostalgia for. And again, I, I find that pretty cool. Uh, one thing I did really enjoy was the fact that when I asked her about her approach to using landscapes in her works, that she doesn't focus on it very much, which is kind of weird to me. I don't know, they, they seem really just brilliant in her work, so I would have figured there's more attention to that. Uh, and the fact that she says she's bad at drawing backgrounds, I, I don't know if I agree with that. But I like that she uses the, the phrase that she tries to convey the vibe of her settings, which I think works brilliantly because of how the city ends up transforming and taking on the qualities of the people around her, the people around her characters, and you know what they're feeling and what it's supposed to be conveyed there. And ultimately, that helps the city become this pretty nice place as well. That And she's drawing on past nostalgia as well for you know, reasons as to why she depicts settings like the listening to music on the bus and everything. It's because it's familiar to her, and I'm sure it's familiar to a lot of people modernly now. And it's it's nice to sort of see this conveyed comfortably. Because uh, again, I've said this before, I don't think it gets shown nearly enough. Then the reasoning for her use of trains is, again, past love for it she enjoys traveling she enjoys traveling on trains specifically and i don't know i i think that's that's cool that it's all these influences that are coming into her work and helping it create this in my opinion very unique product that i really enjoy uh let me rewind that a little bit not unique product unique piece of art i, I try to avoid words like product and stuff I, I don't like them they don't uh as the cool kids say vibe with me anyway that's the end of it <laughs>